Well, good evening. Let's try that again. Good evening. Good evening. Are you glad you're in the Lord's house tonight? I've been away for a few weeks doing taxes, and I want to say before I do anything else, I want to say thank you to Kim uh, for leading the music these last several weeks. I appreciate her stepping in whenever she's asked to, and I do appreciate all that help. We're going to sing tonight. We're going to do some different stuff maybe than we're used to. But we're going to all praise the Lord and worship Him together. Get those hymnals tonight and turn with me over to page 354. 354, all because of God's amazing grace. Aren't you grateful for God's grace in your life? song it's all because of God's amazing grace aren't you thankful for that grace and truly there's no other way to describe it but amazing think where we'd be at tonight folks if it weren't for the grace of God where would you be where would I be Lord only knows where we'd be tonight if it weren't for that grace. I want us to stand and sing that course again. And I just want us to praise the Lord. You don't need the books for this course. It, we've sung it three times now. You ought to have it memorized, okay? 
But let's just put those books down and sing this tonight from the depths of our hearts. And if you really mean it, why don't you just give a little testimony? It's all because of God's amazing grace. Let's praise him tonight. And it's all because of God's amazing grace. Because on Calvary's mountain he took my place. And someday, some glorious morning, I shall see him face to face. All because of God's amazing grace. And it's all because of God's amazing grace. Because on Calvary's mountain, he took my place. And someday, some glorious morning, I shall see him face to face all because of God's amazing grace. Amen. Remain standing. Put those books down. Whoa, what? <laughs> you don't need the books for this next one. It's an old one. And I think we're all going to know it. It's right along what we just sang. It was clear back there in 1779. Some of you remember that. No, maybe. 1779, a guy by the name of John Newton wrote these words that have become so familiar to us, words that we've learned to love and appreciate. And we can sing them without the book. We know it so well. And we're going to sing that old song, Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound that saved an old wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. You see, I grew up in the church. I've been around the church my entire life. You've heard me tell that many, many times. It just seems like it's longer and longer and longer since way back then. And there are some things that I remember from my childhood that I'll never forget. And one of them was when they would stand on Sunday night and we'd start singing Amazing Grace. And all of a sudden, they'd say, why don't you turn around and shake hands with a few people, hug a few necks, let somebody know how much you love them. And so that's what we're going to do tonight. That's why I want your books down. We're going to sing. You get up. You move around. You tell others you love them. And we're just going to have a good old-fashioned old handshaking ceremony. Can we do that tonight? Let's sing together as we do it. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. Was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. His grace hath brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home when we've been there ten thousand years bright shining as the
Folks, we're not done yet. We're, I told you, I'm old, and I remember some old things that we used to do. Pastor Bill actually is the one that asked if we could have this handshaking, and he's preaching tonight, so I listened to him. Pastor Bill also asked if we could do something else, and I remember it from my childhood days. I remember getting around the altar and praying out. Now, some of you remember, I mean, some of you, we, we, we've gotten a little quiet, okay? Let's face it, we've gotten a little quiet. I remember times in my home church when we'd call for the people to come and pray, and I mean, tell you, you thought something was going on all over the place because... Bill Keffer was praying over here and Lake O'Connolly over here and somebody else over there. And let me tell you, you didn't know who was talking to who, but it wasn't mattered who was talking to who down here because they were all talking to him. And tonight what I want us to do is I want as many of you that can and will come and gather around the front of the altar and come gather on the front seats. And I want us tonight to have what they can, uh, refer to as a chorus of prayer. Okay? whereby we're all just going to pray out. I'm not going to ask, uh, my mind just, whoo, yeah, Todorovich back here, Mike. <laughs> I'm not going to ask Mike to lead us. We're all going to lead, okay? We're all going to pray out tonight. So we're going to sing that amazing grace one more time, and I want to invite you tonight to come and join us. Come gather around the altar, gather around the front pews, and then we're going to have a concert of prayer together. Father, come tonight as we sing. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind. But now I see When we've been there Ten thousand years Bright shining as the sun We've no less days to see God's praise than when we first begun. If you'd like to kneel, let's kneel together and let's pray. Father God, tonight we are calling out to you. And Father, we are grateful tonight for the chance to be in your house. Father, we've missed being these times together on Sunday night while I've been away working. But Father, tonight I am grateful and I'm thankful for the chance to be in your house with your people tonight. Father, I am so glad tonight for the grace of God that reaches down to us and has reached down to us and continues to reach down. And Father, you meet our every need, and we're so grateful for that tonight. We're grateful tonight for salvation. We're grateful tonight for sins forgiven. We're grateful tonight for healing. We're grateful tonight for that touch when we just need a brand new touch from you. And Father, tonight I just pray that as we've come into your house this evening and we've gathered in this place for one purpose and one purpose only, Father, we've come tonight to see Jesus. 
We've not come tonight to be seen or to be heard by anyone else, but, Father, we've come tonight to hear from you. And, Father, tonight I just pray that in a very special way that you would descend upon this place as we already sense your spirit is here. Father, I just pray that tonight that you would come in a very special way. Father, there are needs among us. There are those that we prayed for this morning. There are those, Father, that are in the hospital that still need a touch from you. There are those tonight that are sick at home that need that touch. Father, there are those tonight that have a spiritual need that we need to just continue to lift up before the throne of God. Father, there are those tonight with emotional needs that need that. There are those with financial needs. There are those with all kinds of needs tonight. And Father, I just pray that in a very special way that the hand of God would reach down. <coughs> that, Father, tonight you would meet us at the point of our needs. Father, we just know that tonight you want to do something special in this time. Father, we've come together for one purpose, and that is for you. We've come to worship you and to lift you up. And so, Father, tonight as we continue to lift up the name of Jesus, as we continue to praise you and we continue to give you glory and honor for all that you've done, Father, would you just find our worship acceptable in your sight? Father, I pray tonight that you be with Brother Bill as he speaks tonight. Share through him what you would have us to hear. Father, I pray that you would touch our ears and make us hear what you want us to hear. Open our eyes to see what you want us to see. And Father God, tonight, just have complete and total right away. Father, tonight, everything we say, everything we do, we've come tonight to praise you and to honor you. And Father, tonight, we just ask that in a very special way, that when we leave here, we'd each and every one be able to say, truly it has been good to be in the house of the Lord. Father, we praise you tonight for who you are and for what you mean to us. And we're going to give you praise. We're going to give you glory and all the honor in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God, 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 praise God. Grab those hymnals one more time. We're going to sing one more song before we turn Brother Bill over loose on you tonight it's over on 111 it's one of my very favorites it's 111 it simply says my wonderful lord my wonderful lord let's sing together i have found a deep peace that i never had known and a joy this world could not afford since I yielded control of my body and soul to my wonderful wonderful Lord my wonderful Lord my wonderful Lord by a Angels and seraphs in heaven adored. I bow at thy shrine, my Savior divine. My wonderful, wonderful Lord. I desire that my life shall be ordered by thee that my will be in perfect accord with thine own sovereign will thy desires to fulfill my wonderful wonderful lord my wonderful lord my Wonderful Lord, by angels and seraphs in heaven adored, I bow at thy shrine, my Savior divine, my wonderful, wonderful. 
wonderful Lord. All the talents I have, I have laid at thy feet. Thy approval shall be my reward. Be my store, great or small, I surrender it all to my wonderful, wonderful Lord. My wonderful Lord, my wonderful Lord, my angels and seraphs in heaven adored. I bow at thy shrine, my Savior divine, my wonderful, wonderful Lord. Thou art fairer to me than the fairest of earth, thou omnipotent life-giving word. O thou ancient of days, thou art worthy all praise. My wonderful, wonderful Lord. My wonderful Lord. My wonderful and seraphs in heaven adored. I bow at thy shrine, my Savior divine, my wonderful, wonderful Lord. Susan, just keep playing that for a moment. <clears throat> that was going to be all I did tonight, and I was going to call on Bill, but I I just feel like we need to do something else. It was good to see Janie slip in. We've been praying for Jerry and thinking about Jerry. And Mike, I am going to call on you now. I need you to come up here, brother. And I would just like some of the ladies just to kind of slide over here near Janie. Because, you know, Jerry's going through a lot physically. But, you know, if you've ever been there or done that... It's going to be just as hard on that lady, all that she's going through. And tonight, I just want some of you ladies to gather around Janie. Let her know how much we love her as you do that. And I'm going to have Brother Mike pray for us. And after Pastor Mike has prayed, then I'm going to turn it over to Bill to bring us the evening message. Visited with Jerry this morning. He has such a sweet sweet attitude I thank God for our saints you see they're still his saints in the hospital at home wherever they are God's so great he transcends the mountains and the valleys he didn't God doesn't have to check in when you go into the hospital he just goes isn't it great to serve a living God we'll come back here so I can touch our hand Janie Father, we do love you. And God, how I love our church and how I love our church family. And God, one of our, when one of our brothers or sisters are hurting, God, it, it breaks our heart. And God, we hurt. God, we thank you for Jerry and Janie. We thank you for their lives. God, we thank you for their witness, for their faithfulness. And God, we know that you hear our prayers. We know that you answer our prayers. And God, you know that you love us. God, today we thank you for the, for the hospitals and for the doctors and for the nurses and for the medicine. But God, we close that prayer with thanking you for Jesus, through whose blood we can come to you. And God, we thank you for that blood just now. And God, we plead that blood on behalf of our dear brother and all those others in our prayer. But just now, Lord, for Jerry, we just ask that you'd reach down from heaven, God, in a mighty way, Lord, and just touch him in a way that, that even there he just gets shivers from your Holy Ghost being right there with him. So God, we just want to thank you and tell you we love you. Lord, lifting this dear family and all the others in our church up in your prayer. In Jesus' name. We love you, Janie.
wonderful be in the presence of an almighty God. I pray sometimes that the Holy Spirit will show up and then I get checked because the Holy Spirit shows up if we show up. What we need to do is release him and let him do what he wants to do. I think thankful tonight for a privilege to preach the word of God. You know, you guys have been called to preach. You got to preach. Okay? And it's not necessarily here in the church, but I get the privilege to preach almost every day to, to lost people that some of them have no idea about God. They're very unchurched. But they need Jesus. Even the ones that know about church and know about God, we need church. And I thought throughout the, since Pastor Randy gives us a sheet that says we're to preach a certain week, and my mind has been rolling through, through things what would be appropriate for the service tonight. And I thank you for you that have come, the good crowd tonight. I hope you didn't come, but for one reason, and that was to worship God. Not to hear me preach or Joe sing or Susan play or whatever goes on. Those are great religious acts. But tonight, this is something that God has given me over the last two or three weeks or months, that have we become a society where we're religious but we're not born again. See, there's two totally different opposite things. Are we religious? Are we doing the right religious things? But do we have that personal relationship with Jesus Christ? That's the only thing that really counts. That's the only thing that's really going to matter when you take your last breath. When anyone in this world takes their last breath, I witnessed a millionaire boss one time, and he said, I'm not too sure about all this stuff you're trying to tell me. And I left him with this statement, as, as well as a fellow that walks out here past the prayer chapel. He told me the same thing. He said, I don't believe in all that stuff you all try to push. The very split second, that which God gave them, which is the breath of life, departs that body, they're going to realize they made a major mistake. So it's not being religious that counts. It's having that born-again relationship with Jesus Christ. We're going to take our message tonight. We're going to dwell on a couple probably well-known guys that you've all heard about, because most of you here tonight. I think you've been in church long enough, and you've been around church long enough, or maybe in your families you've heard about these fellows, and we're going to, both of these guys were very, very religious, very religious. They had brought up as Pharisees and been all around, and the Pharisees in those days were the, they, they were the religious movement. They were the, they were it. They, they studied the law, and they, they had it all down, and Jesus himself had a little problem with that bunch, didn't he? But, but I thought, and I, I looked up Pharisees in my Bible dictionary, and I, I just want to read a few of their characteristics that you can understand when I get to these two men why they believed the way they believed, why they were so religious. The Pharisees were super legalistic. You remember Jesus had an encounter with them about the Sabbath day one time. They were very self-righteous. They were people who went around, even had their own garb that they wore, so they had people to recognize who they was. One time they was one says, I this, I, 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 I done all this. And that old poor Republican over there just said, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. He didn't want the Pharisee religion, but he wanted the born-again salvation. In Semitic form, 
Pharisee means separated one. Loved of God. One loyal to God. That's what Pharisee meant. They put Jewish legalism at the very top of their priority. Very top was all about keeping the law. Keeping all these little. And, and not only did they have the Ten Commandments. But they added I've heard 500, 700, 1,000 precepts to that law. Trying to make them more perfect. They couldn't even keep the ten, let alone the 700. But they were very legalistic. Phariseeism and Judaism almost become synonymous in the early church. So we, we get this Pharisees actually become a fraternal order or a religious society. That was a, what the Pharisees were all about. They were considered as very much experts in interpreting the scriptures. But when Jesus came along, they started having some run-ins with Jesus over the legalistics of the scripture. The two men that we're going to look at tonight, one of them is Nicodemus. One of them is Nicodemus. And the other one is Paul, Saul, ever which way you want to call him. I like to call him Paul because that's the guy that I, I like. The Saul guy, he was one of them religious guys out killing Christians, and we'll get to that in a little bit. I looked at the meaning of the word religious, and all it means is they adhered to a religion. So that takes me to another word, religion. What is a religion? It is a belief in a superhuman power or powers that must be obeyed and worshipped. It says any specific system of belief. Or it's a state of mind or a way of life. I think that last one is where we in America probably have said it, have come into a religion is anything that you worship or it's just a way of life. They've done away with hell. They've done away with all, everything that the scriptures very strongly preach and teach against. They've done away with all that because it's whatever's good for me. I think Pastor Randy hit on that a little bit this morning. It's okay whatever's right for you. That may be religious, but that's not being born again. So I want to examine these two guys a little bit. and Both men a very religious bunch that they followed and they were part of. Nicodemus was a guy that one of the leading Pharisees of his time. He was a ruler of the Jews, the Bible says. He was a member of the Sanhedrin, which I like to look at the Sanhedrin in those days was like our Supreme Court today. That's where they all appealed to was the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin had all kinds of power to, uh, to kill you, actually, if, if they desired to do so. And, and Nicodemus was one of the three richest men in Jerusalem in the day that the scripture that we'll look into, which is John 3, 3, 4, and 5. And, but we want to get to another scripture before we get to that one. Nicodemus came to Jesus by night. And I've heard all kinds of, all kinds of people talk about, well, Nicodemus was ashamed, Nicodemus was this, Nicodemus was that. Uh, I, I believe that he was brought there because of conviction from God. I believe he'd heard Jesus preach. He had heard about this man called Jesus. And maybe just curiosity. Maybe he was curious about who this guy really was. I want to shake that guy's hand. I want to know what he's all about. But regardless of why he came, he came because he was led by God. He had something missing in his religious life. He knew something wasn't quite right in his religious life. So Nicodemus came by night to ask Jesus some questions. Whether it be our curiosity, whether it be our conviction, it doesn't really matter. He came. And that's the important thing that people need to do. They need to come to Jesus Christ. He probably thought, he probably thought this is 
Here, here, here's this little young whippersnapper over here, and, and only about, probably about 30 years old at that time, 31. And, 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 and he come to, to Jesus and, and, and said, called him rabbi. That's probably pretty condescending to this high up guy in the Pharisee movement to talk to this, this young guy and call him rabbi. And I, I love the way Jesus handled that. I, I, I dug into that a little bit, and I loved the way Jesus handled that. He went by through, just blowed all, he just went through all the blow to smoke away and got to the very heart of the problem. Nicodemus, you need Jesus. All that other stuff, he just blew away. He didn't get all puffed up and chest all stuck out. He just called me rabbi. But he got to the core of Nicodemus's problem. You need Jesus. You need to be born again, Nicodemus. Got right down to the core. And I thought sometimes, you know, uh, people, uh, uh, especially the guys that I, I talk to, the, the, when you get down to really the nitty-gritty, they want to blow you off and just move on to something else. And i got to turn them right back around. You need Jesus in your life. Nicodemus need Jesus. And I thought, you know, that Jesus was this young man from Galilee, didn't have a real strong resume as far as the Pharisees were concerned. But Jesus, instead of being all puffed up, he recognized Nicodemus' need. You need this personal relationship with me. You need the personal relationship with me. This religious movement and sect that you're after and that you're following here called the Pharisees, it's just not getting it. And I'm adding that. That's not in the Bible. But what he is saying is there needs to be a transformation take place in your life. You need to be transformed from who you are into who you need to be, and that is not being just religious, but having a relationship with Jesus. That's what this is all about, Nicodemus. You need, to, you need the personal relationship and a transformation in 2 Corinthians 5, verses 17 and 18, the scripture says this. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things pass away, behold, all things become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. That is a transformation that needs to take place in every one of our lives. Every one of our lives, we need this personal experience with Jesus. We're go I'm, I'm going to get into some things, and this is when I start, the old, uh, some people say this is, he quit preaching and started meddling. We're going to get into some of these things that are religious, but it don't bring salvation. We're going to get into a few of them at the end of the message. So you can just get ready, buckle up, get your hard hat on, your hard toes, and, and, and don't forget your, your vest. You've got to have a vest so everybody can see, okay, and you won't get run over. That's coal, coal mine talk there, okay? All right, let's go and look in John 3. St. John chapter 3, this is where this whole story takes place. And we're going to dwell on 3, 4, and 5 for right now. And, and the conversation that, that Jesus and Nicodemus had. Nicodemus came to Jesus by night. We've already went over that. And, and, he, and he, he says in, in verse 3, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Underline he cannot. He cannot see or enter into the kingdom of God unless something takes place in his life. And that is to be born again. Nicodemus responded like this. He's thinking fleshly. He was thinking out of the natural. He was saying, well, how can a man enter the second time in his mother's womb and be born? That's not, that's not a possible thing. But Nicodemus failed to realize that this was a spiritual thing that Jesus was talking to him about. He was still living in the flesh. Jesus goes on. He says, you must be born of water and of the Spirit. Now, that, that, you have to understand that that's not water baptism. You're not saved because you're baptized in the water. 
You can be baptized 14 times until the frogs know you by your first name, and it will not save you. It will not save you. That's a religious act, but that will not save you. I believe after we're saved, we want to follow him in, in, in baptism. I think that's, that's, that's good. That's putting on armor and putting on things that we need to do, but that will not save you. But to hear this water here and the spirit that Jesus is telling him that, that it is a figurative sense for salvation. You need to be washed in the cleansing word of God by the word of God. We're saved by grace through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. So water here is used figuratively. He's cleansed, he's born again by the word of God. Nicodemus did not understand that. And I'm not sure at that point in time and in his encounter with Jesus that he understood that. I think later on he began to see some things. He began to, to move toward and in, in the right direction. But at this point and moment of time, I'm not sure that he really fully understand. He left that encounter with Jesus still very religious, but I don't believe he was born again at this point in time. We find some things that, that he began to do as we move through the scriptures, and we'll get to those as we go through the scriptures as well. We know that he stood up for Jesus there in the Sanhedrin when they were uh, sentencing Jesus and talking about uh, killing him. And he said, wait, 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 wait a minute. It's not right to do an injustice to someone without a trial. And we know there at his burial that he actually produced some, uh, uh, some of the uh, spices and stuff and embalmed him. And uh, Joseph, Joseph or Arimathea, uh, they buried Jesus' body. So G Judas, uh, uh, Judas, yeah, Nicodemus had moved from where he was here to where he was at that point in time. We really don't find there. I haven't. If you all help me out, if you found it here, you tell me after the message that where it actually says that Nicodemus accepted Jesus. Leave that to your own. Leave that to your own judgment. But I believe personally that he did of some of the things that he done later in his life. Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea, they were on the Sanhedrin. We know that Joseph Arimathea, I looked him up also in my Bible dictionary, he was a very righteous man. Even though he was a Pharisee, he was a very righteous man. He was one that looked for the coming of Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God. Nicodemus, very, very religious. But I believe he was a changed man after his encounter with Jesus. I believe he understood some things more in depth before, after his encounter with Jesus than he did before. Nicodemus' steps toward this change that needs to take place, this transformation that needs to take place. The first step is always you need to come. You need to get information. You need to, need to understand. Nicodemus, I believe, didn't get it at first encounter as to what Jesus was talking about. He was still in the, in the flesh. But we know in John 3, 1 that he did come to Jesus. He began to ask the questions. I love when some of the guys come up to me and start asking questions. I know they're interested. I know that the Holy Spirit's begin to work and move. We find that in, in the seventh chapter of John, verses 50 and 51, we find it where he testified for, for Jesus. It was actually was defending him. And then in the 19th chapter of John, verse 39, is where he actually done the service of the, of the burial and the spices. So you see the progression that he came from that night when he came to Jesus until the day that Jesus was actually died. Let's move on to the next man, which is old, old Saul, which turned into Paul. <clears throat> Saul was quite a character. And as bad as a guy as he was, before he, he was very religious, he was a Pharisee, born of a, a, a son of a Pharisee. 
He, he, had, some, he had some real credentials. He, uh, and he used all the things that, that he had in that culture of that day just helped him spread that gospel to the Gentile nations. He was a Hebrew, Roman citizen, a Pharisee, probably. Doesn't call him a Pharisee, but he was taught under the great leader of the Pharisees. But in Paul's life, his early life, there was three things that really helped Paul in, 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 in his ministry. The Greek culture, the Roman citizenship, and the Hebrew religion. I call it Hebrew religion because at that point in time, it was Judaism. Judaism was, and still is, the Jews' religion. Today, they still do not believe Jesus Christ has come, the first coming. They don't believe that Jesus has ever been born yet. What we call the second coming, they call, that's when they will recognize him as coming, as Lord and Savior, because we know that he comes with power the next time. He comes as a little baby the first time. But Paul used all of these three things that was part of his upbringing and part of his character. He used all three of these in his ministry. And he knew how to play it when Paul, Paul was one of them geniuses. I mean, Paul was a sharp cookie. I can just imagine him. Now, I don't know. I've never seen pictures, and I don't know anybody. Joe, you thought you were old. I'm older than you, and I don't remember Paul. Uh, but I, I, just, I just sort of, in my mind, I pictured Paul as just being one of these little short guys. Maybe he didn't have, probably had less hair than I did. Okay? But he was, and what hair he did have was red. Because red is fiery, right? If you're red-headed, you're fiery. Okay? And I can just, think, I just imagine Paul's being this little short, bald-headed guy with all kinds of spit and fire about him. I mean, he, he, he'd just walk up to a snake and look it in the eye and says, you can't hurt me. Why do I say that? Because a snake can't hurt. He got bit by a viper, a deadly viper. Shook that baby off in the fire and just kept on doing what he was doing. But that's, that's just my picture of, of, of Paul. And that, 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 the Saul name that was a Greek name, it was a, uh, I'm sorry, I think it was a Hebrew name. I got it here in my notes. I really do. It's in my notes, Jimmy. I just got to find them. <laughs> that was a joke. If you weren't here last time Jimmy preached, he had his notes up here, and he had page 1 and page 10 and page 6 and page 1, and, and, and he, he, he finally, you got it, though, didn't you? You finally got it. That's all that matters. You got the good word. That was a good word. He preached on the two roads. See, I remember. I was listening. You thought I was asleep, didn't you? He preached on the two roads. But here, let's get back to old Paul. In Acts 13, verse 9, the scripture says to Saul, who is also called Paul. So we find that there was a name change. And I've heard all kinds of things about that as well. I, I really don't know, don't care, don't matter. Why he was Saul and then turned to Paul. One was a Greek name, a Hebrew name. One was, one was uh, but we do know that Paul had a reputation of killing Christians. And, and I personally maybe think that the name change helped to transition from old Paul being the bad guy to being the good guy. Just me, okay. But Paul, Saul... He was breathing out threats. But I, I thought sort of like Nicodemus came to Jesus. I believe Paul's beginning of his journey from religion to being born again started when Stephen was stoned to death. Guess who they, these guys were stoning old Stephen to death? Where did they lay their robes? at the feet of this young guy named Saul. There was something in Stephen's life as he was dying. Stones were penetrating his body and taking the very breath of life out of his body. Something about his witness, something about his fortitude right there that said, Paul, 
what you got ain't good enough, buddy. But he still was breathing out threats. He even went to the high priest and said, hey, give me some letters to go, to, go, go get these Christians. Go get these Christians. Paul was trained, remember, under Gamriel. Gamriel, ever how you spell it? G-A-M-A-L-I-E, I think. Okay. He was a son of a Pharisee. We know that Gamaliel was a, was a very deeply ingrained in Judaism. So was Paul. But Paul here had one thing that, that I found as I was reading about Paul, that he was so convinced that the Christians, which was at that point in time was called the way, that they were a bunch of heretics. They were crazy. They had, they had already went off the deep end. And, and it, was, it was an honor that was given to him to kill Christians. He thought he was doing Jehovah a great, great thing to exterminating Christians. And he was so zealous about this that he went to that high priest and said, give me these, give me all the names you can, give me all these names of these Christians. But oh my. What happened next? Old Paul was on his way. He was ready. He was all fired up. Ready to go get a whole bunch of Christians. And he's on a road called Damascus. He had an encounter with Jesus. Pretty plain words were spoken to Paul, to Saul at that time. Saul, Saul, why persecute? Why are you persecuting me? The very guy that he was trying to do harm to was talking to him. And I don't know if you remember, I remember very much the night that the Holy Spirit began to speak to me. I was brought up in her very religious home. Mama, pray far down on your head. But I remember that time when the Holy Spirit was just wearing me out. Why? Why, Why are you doing what you're doing? I was 15 years old. I still was meaner than a snake. Just ask a wife. I told her some of the things I'd done. I'd take ball bats to people, rocks. See, I was a little skinny about... 70 pound guy in middle school I didn't have no sisters no brothers and nobody to take care of me old Bill had to take care of himself and I was I was mean but how that Holy Spirit can just change us can mellow us down can make us a vessel totally transformed into who he wants us to be. I believe that encounter that Nicodemus had, it changed him. This encounter that Paul had, Saul had here with Jesus changed him from being religious to having that personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Acts 9, 20 and 21 says this, Paul changed from being the one that was wanting to kill Christians, wanting to kill the very seed of God to becoming a preacher. In verse 20 it says, straightway he preached Christ in a synagogue that he is the Son of God. Preach Jesus that he is the Son of God. Paul in some of his messages and some of his writings he said, I have no doctrine, I'm paraphrasing this, okay, I have no doctrine to preach except 
Christ and him crucified. What a message. Preach Christ and him crucified. Preach Christ and him crucified. Verse 21 says, All that heard him were amazed and said, Is not this he that destroyed them which called on his name in Jerusalem? Is this the same guy? Is this the same guy that had his fist full of warrants going to bring the Christians back to Jerusalem to be put on trial? Is this this same guy? We know the story of, of Paul and his recovery fasted three days and and and, and uh, Anna, uh, God spoke to an angel, spoke through an angel, and told the old boy, he said, go down there and touch old Paul. So I'm not going down there, that fellow killed me. No, Saul may have, but this new creature in Christ, no. No, that was all behind him, wasn't it? It was all behind him. He was a new create creature in Christ. Saul was once the hunter, and we find out throughout his life he became the hunted. Because now the Pharisees and all the religious movements that he had pushed so hard for, they were after him. They were after him. He changed from the hunter to the hunted. The transformation from the old man into the new man was a total turnaround. While studying for this message, now we're getting into meddling. While studying for this message, I began to just thinking about the various ways that in our society today. And has this age that we're living in now, this time in history that we're in right now, have we become more and more and more religious? I'll use 2 Timothy 3, 5, and 7 to prove my point here. It says, in the end time, the later day, latter days, they'll have a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. Verse 7 says, ever learning, never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. See, the truth is what Jesus said. Jesus said, you must be born again. You must be born again. Have we come to a time in our society when repentance is not important? It's not necessary. Everybody goes to heaven. Have we become so wrapped up in religious acts that we've lost a true meaning of repentance. Second Timothy chapter four, verse three says this, the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. Verse four says, and shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned into fables. I want you to listen real, real close right now. This is not in any way meant to be judgmental. I'm just trying to prove my point. Just prove my point. We cannot just do religious acts. We cannot just go through motions. We cannot do Kevin, I'm going to use you as an example, son. Is that okay? You know where I'm going with this. Kevin here was converted out of Mormonism. We, we've come, become very close friends. He shared a lot of Mormonism with me, what it's all about. And the bottom line is it's all about keeping a bunch of rules. Very religious. Very religious acts. They do great things. We all know what Mormons do. They do great things. They have a big storehouse that takes care of millions of people. That's a religious act. But 
Kevin told me just a couple months ago, he said, I was just going through the motions. I was being religious, but I did not have a personal relationship with Jesus. He'll tell you now he does. He said, I met the master, a man called Jesus, and I have this personal relationship with him. So religious acts, doing things that are religious. Here are some religious acts that I'm just going to throw out. Well, I come to church every time the doors are open. Praise God. Pastor Randy and God's very pleased with that, I'm sure. Will that save you? Correct answer. Well, my name's on the church book. Will that save you? Three of you's awake. I like a little story about it. Pastor Mike, you probably ever used this yourself. If your name is on the church book and that's your dependency on getting to heaven, what well, if a mouse came into the church and ate the roll up? <laughs> Been on a church, church roll won't save you. Oh, here's a good one. Well, I've been on the church board for 43 years. Will that save you? One more awake. Well, preacher, I sing in the choir. Will that save you? Whew, we're, getting there. we're getting there. Hey, I've taught Bible class. For 12 years. Will that save you? <laughs> We're gaining every time. I've got about five more. The time I get to the end of this, everybody will be saying no. Well, I, I feed the poor. First church, where Raymond and Virgie goes down to first church, Pastor Randy goes down there. We go down there, someone first and third and whatever nights it is and feed the poor, is that going to save anybody? No. No. Are these good religious acts? Don't say no. <laughs> the answer to that is good religious acts who will not save us. Well, I've read the Bible through probably at least ten times in my life. Will that save them? No. I help the needy. Every one of these people stands out there with these signs, need help. I give them a 5 or a $10 bill every time I pass one of them. Will that save you? No. Are all these good religious acts? But are these people that do these religious acts, are they born again? Hope some of them are. But so many, I believe, are not. They've replaced being born again by the religious acts that they do. We have to be careful. Devil will use that. Devil will use that. Well, look what you do. I find in the scripture says, well, have not I cast out devils in your name? Have I not done all this and done all that? But what's he say? Depart from me. I don't know who you are. Why did he say that? Because our name was not written in the Lamb's book of life. They had not had a born again experience. You can add a whole lot of other good works to this. All these things are very good acts, but not one single one of those will save our souls from hell. The truth of the whole matter still remains in John 3, 3. When Jesus spoke to Nicodemus and said, ye must be born again. 
except a man be born again. He cannot see the kingdom of God. That's Jesus speaking. That's not me, not Pastor Randy, not any man, woman, boy, or girl saying that. Jesus said that. And if you have a red letter, red lettered edition of the Bible, it's red lettered. That's Jesus speaking. Not one earthly man, but the Son of the Almighty God spoke that truth. So again, I ask this question, and this is a question for you. Every one of us right here tonight, every one of us right here tonight, and those who are watching, whoever you may be, am I born again? Or am I just religious? Here's a bottom line to all this as well, not only for us. But if we're going to win the loss to Jesus, if we're going to win the world to Jesus, we have to be a possessor, not just a professor. We can profess all these good works, makes us look good, made the Pharisees look good, all the good things that they've done. And I believe another thing that's so important, we must believe in whom we serve. We must know him, must have his personal relationship. We don't just know about him, but we must know him. Knowing about him, you read the Bible 10 times, you'll know about him. But do you have that relationship? Do we have that relationship? It's an everyday thing, guys. Paul said, take up your cross daily, doesn't he? So I ask you, as Joe maybe would come and Susan would come back. That we'd search ourselves tonight. And we could answer this all-important question. Are we born again? Have I invited Jesus Christ into my heart and into my life? And have I, have I had that transformation? Have I had that turnaround? Did I become a new creation, creature, new creature in Christ? Where the old things passed away and all things become new. So are we born again? Or are we just religious? The days of end time are upon us, in case you haven't noticed. I cannot tell you when, the day or the hour that Jesus Christ will come. No man knows, not even Jesus knows, the Father only. But I can tell you this. It's closer than it was when I was five years old. Bible says the fields are white. They're ready for harvest. Me and a guy was talking about being a salesperson. I've pretty much been in sales my whole life, not only trying to sell Jesus to people, but also in, in my secular job. And one of the things that makes you a successful salesman is you know your product. You're convinced that your product is the best product on the market. Let me tell you something, it's Jesus. It's the best product on the market. And I'm not saying that in any derogative way. It's the best product. Because knowing Him, knowing Him as our personal Savior, the Scripture says all these light afflictions and I can talk to you, every one of you sitting here, you've got issues, you've got problems you're dealing with in your life. And I call those things just light afflictions. Some are more, more 
critical than others. I understand that. But just look what's waiting for us. Not because we're religious, because I have Jesus as my personal Savior. So as you bow your heads, Joe sings, Susan plays. There'd be a need in this sanctuary tonight. Billy Graham said many times that people would come and to the altar in his crusades and he said a common thing was when well, I've been a church member for 40 years but I don't know this Jesus you're talking about. So see it don't matter what you are what you have been. Nicodemus and Saul and Paul they proved that. It's not what they were. We can look at David. It's not what David was. It's what he became. So tonight, this is an opportunity for you. Just come to Jesus and be born of the water and of the Spirit. As they sing, as you meditate, you answer that question. You answer that question. Am I born again? Have thine affections been nailed to the cross? Is thy heart right with God? Yes, Speak to him. Dost Speak thou to count Lord. all things for Lord, Jesus Father, but loss? Is thy Lord, heart right with God? Is thy heart right with God? Washed in the crimson flood, cleansed and made holy, humble and lowly, right in the sight of God. Hast thou dominion or self and or sin? Is thy heart right with God? Over all evil without and within, is thy heart right with God? Is thy heart right with God? Washed in the crimson flood, cleansed and made holy, humble and lowly, right in the sight of God. For another day that you've given us another time father that we can share the precious word we pray father as we leave this place that we will not forget father that we need a personal relationship with you I know there's many needs tonight many physical needs many financial needs maybe relationship and emotional needs but God the greatest need of all is that relationship with you. So I pray that you would just go with us as we depart from this place, as we go out into the hedges, the highways, and the byways, that we can tell people about your love and about your mercy and your forgiveness. And we'll give you glory and praise and honor for all you do, all you have done, all you will do for those that just by faith will believe and trust you. So may you just bless and honor your word. Give us safety as we travel. In the precious name of Jesus, we ask these things. Amen. Amen. Thank you for coming. Pray that God will bless you real good down through the coming week.